Hello and welcome. What has three decades of strict Islamic rule done to Iran, socially and politically? Well, as the country marks the 31st anniversary of its Islamic revolution, critics and supporters are recalling a shift in leadership which shocked the world and made political Islam a force to be reckoned with. But are all Iranians celebrating? And the people of Iran from all walks of life and all backgrounds, whether Islamic, nationalist or Marxist, had come together in the late 1970s to overthrow the Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who had been ruling with an iron fist. By 1979, the West-leaning government was replaced with an Islamic Republic under Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. But now many Iranians are questioning their leaders. After the elections of last summer, thousands took to the streets, demanding more freedoms and claiming that the results, which gave President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad the second term, were rigged. Dozens of protesters were killed and hundreds remain in prison. In the days preceding this 31st anniversary, Tehran warned it would not tolerate anti-government demonstrations and rounded up dissidents and journalists for good measure. But the turmoil seems destined to last. So today we ask what pressure are the people of Iran putting on their leaders to change and what chances there the government would consider a positive response. Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can send an SMS or an email and we welcome your phone calls onto the show as well. Well, I'm joined now by Reza Pahlavi, the son of the last Shah of Iran and uh, heir to the Pahlavi uh, dynasty. Until this day, 31 years ago, he was known as the Crown Prince of Iran, but has lived in exile ever since. He joins us from Paris. Your Highness, good to have you with us. Mr. Khan, good evening. Good to be on your program. So, what this, uh, looking at this uh, 31st anniversary, of course, uh, um, I wonder how you regard it. Has the, the passing of a uh, little over three decades softened the memory of what happened, certainly to your family? Well, you know, I've always uh, have been looking forward into the future, seeing in what way Iran's uh, uh, soulagement from this situation could ultimately culminate. And I think the uh, path that our country has witnessed over the past three decades, as you put it, has been a learning curve which I believe has made today's generation far better equipped than any generations preceding it in tackling the challenges of tomorrow, having learned tremendous amount of experience uh, sometimes under very dire and hard circumstances. But in terms of elements that are critical to achieve a democratic future, I suppose the best lesson learned for a Muslim country who had an experience with it for 14 centuries has been clerical rule or a theocracy of modern days which has made the issue of how important a secular system whereby separation of religion from government is pivotal and fundamental in order to achieve a democratic order is today understood by the masses and is in fact appreciated by the clergy which has also suffered under religious rule in terms of losing its prestige and the kind of respect that was due to religion and the clerical establishment in the now, process. Now, before I, I look at what's happening uh, today in Iran, uh, let me take you back to 31 years and uh, remember when you were a student studying in America at the time as a teenager. Um, what do you recall of, just briefly, what do you recall of that time when basically uh, the news came through of what was happening in your home? Well, there was, of course, a climate of uh, political crisis, uh, part of which, which was due to the main reason why people were protesting for lack of political freedoms that existed at the time, although there were many other elements associated with that. Uh, what was quite vivid uh, uh, in my mind later, later on, and of course, <clears throat> maybe I should not answer that now because you asked me what I thought then, mm -hmm. was clearly that there was an opposition mobilized against my father's regime but I'm not sure whether at the time they were quite focused as to exactly what would be the outcome. And uh, at the time, the, the main demand was the departure of my father or the uh, overthrow of, of his regime in favor of what they hoped would be a solution for the country under the leadership of an Ayatollah, a rather uh, obscure Ayatollah mm -hmm. at the time, where, which not, not many people really knew about, but somehow was prompted in the forefront and uh, hoping that maybe through that change... Uh, uh, they will achieve uh, their goals. Now, I wonder, when you look at uh, the demonstrations of now uh, um, and those uh, third, three decades ago, a lot of people make a comparison and say that the demonstrations against your father parallel those uh, of today against the, the current regime. Do you see that parallel? Well, uh, when you see demonstrations on the streets, I will tell you what uh, is vividly different today. Uh, number one, let's not forget one thing. My father opted to leave the country 
to, in order to avoid bloodshed and gave the order to the military not to directly intervene against the people, which facilitated the transition of authority from the previous regime to the current government, something that is quite different under the current regime. Also, what I will say is extremely uh, remarkable in the process is that so far, a, a, a quite an interesting degree of discipline has been observed by the anti-regime demonstrators and forces against it uh, that have restrained themselves from retaliating against security forces in violence. I have myself witnessed a number of footages that came from inside Iran visibly showing that when certain security forces were outnumbered, such as element of the Basij, for example, uh, people did not retaliate against them and in fact let them go. And I think in that sense uh, we have seen more and more elements from the security forces peeling away from the regime and showing sympathy and in fact even solidarity in some cases uh, with the people, uh, which is indicative of the cracks uh, from within. Uh, you can call it a parallel or comparison, but this is something we witnessed today in Iran as recently as uh, the last few hours and of course uh, within the past uh, two months where as you know we had the celebration of Ashura in Iran and of mm -hmm. course uh, uh, all of this has been sustained by this movement to use every opportunity and occasion to, uh, to maintain uh, and sustain the continuity uh, of the protest movement. Now we have a caller on the line from Finland. Mohammed, thanks for joining us. What would you like to ask? Uh, well, uh, hello to everyone. Hi. Actually, my point is that uh, well, the 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 there is a minority of people that are against the system. Okay. Why you touch a well? I respect your uh, your uh, news and everything, but why you just emphasize on such a narrow major, okay. uh, uh, population? And right. today it is such a massive demonstration, okay? And you are just giving the wrong address. Okay, Mohammed, actually, that's an interesting point, and a valid point, of course, and, and Johannes, perhaps, you know, the Green Movement has gone, I should, we should point out, has gone out of its way to say that it actually supports the Islamic nature of the government, but, but is looking for more civil liberties and freedoms. And I wonder if you, you feel, I mean, Mohammed's saying it's a very small resistance, whether you feel that the, the way the Green Movement's going and saying it's supportive of the government, uh, the basis of the government, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's a common view among Iranians. Well, I think the best way I can answer the viewer's question is to say if the clerical regime believed this statement, why would they bother cracking down so severely and murdering our sons and daughters on the streets of Iran if they feel so secure that they're just a blemish or a minority? I beg to differ, sir. I think the majority of the Iranian people in 30 years have had enough with this regime because there's no aspect of Iranian life that has, that has been left unaffected in a negative sense by this regime, starting with women losing their rights to equality, not to mention religious minorities that have been persecuted, not to mention ethnic minor uh, communities in our country, need I say more, not to mention the economic situation that people are suffering under, problems with inflation, unemployment, no hope for the future, youth in our country trying to, in some cases, fl flee from the country to maybe find a very a uh, crude job outside just to be able to breathe and make some living. The writing is on the wall. Uh, saying this from a distance is a sign of utter denial as to what is happening in our country. And I'm sure I'm not alone in witnessing what is happening today in Iran, not just in the main cities, but in the four corners of our land. Now, interestingly enough, though, there are a few things that seem to have improved under the, uh, the theocracies. Uh, the, uh, some of the political um, institutions seem to have more powers than they did before, and there's certainly more health care and education uh, across the population as well. So presumably there's also some benefits that the people have felt as well. I mean, I will, I will left, leave uh, public opinion in Iran to decide. The problem that we have, Mr. Khan, and I think all our viewers will appreciate that, is that there's no way that you can actually measure public sentiment when there's absence of public debate, or open debate for that matter. That, we know, does not exist. So rather than hypothesize about who thinks what, I think the first degree of certainty to know what people really want is to give them the opportunity to speak and to be free to decide and therefore to vote. Does that situation prevail in Iran today? Of course not. 
Therefore, I don't know if it matters whether we want to argue if the country was educated or as you placed it, some institution may appear to have more control. Bottom line is that you have a self-appointed representative of God on earth who decides who deserves to live and who deserves to die. And whoever challenges the system is called uh, someone who is, uh, is an affront to God and is worthy of capital punishment. I don't call that freedom. I don't call that progress. I'm sorry. Let's